All right. Um, my story is pretty linear, actually. It's um, as a as a kid, I was always uh, um, very interested in like what my parents were doing while I was at school. Right? They're just like, I have a job, and I was like, at some point, I need to do that too. And that was uh, that was kind of scary and weird until I realized that um, you could actually do a job that you might like, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, my parents knew that I was really into Lego, so they got me this uh, this book called The Ultimate Lego Book, which is published by DK. I think it's from 1999. Um, and um, it has a picture of a bunch of people working in the building that's just like right over there, um, working on Rock Raiders, which is one of my favorite themes as a kid because it was so weird and crazy. And um, when I saw that picture, I basically, it, it kind of just imprinted on me. And I knew that that was the thing that I wanted to do with my life. So I think I was around four, five, uh, when I realized that that is what I wanted to do. My mom is actually an industrial designer. So she actually knows quite a bit about like the path to take and the background you need for having a job like that. Um, so I talked to my parents and they're like, yeah, you need to go to school. It's of course very, very nice, very nice for your parents to give you a good excuse to send you to school. Uh, so I took uh, I took basically the very much the, the beaten path where I took uh, an education and I went to high school sp specifically towards a technical direction. And then uh, I went to university for industrial design where I, in my last year of my bachelor, I had a uh, uh, an internship, which I managed to get at Lego. Um, and then that got extended and then I got extended again <laughs> uh, as a form of my final bachelor project. And in the middle of uh, writing my thesis for my bachelor, um, they ended up hiring me full time, um, and that was uh, that was about five years ago. Um, it's uh, my sixth anniversary is coming up in two months. Here at Lego. That's awesome. Usually, yeah. Usually, when like you're like five and you're like, "What do you want to be?" and you grow up, it's like, "I want to be an astronaut or like a clown." And but no, you had the you had the same idea the entire way through. That's kind of cool. Yeah, I think um, I think the whole concept of having a goal and motivation was already at that point very important for me. Like as a kid, I just wanted to know what was what I was going to be doing, right? Um, so it was it was always on my mind, and it was always when people ask me, "Is like have you if you given up yet?" It's like, no, no, we're still going. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was always a very nice um, kind of star on the horizon to chase, um, which made it very weird to actually be here because at that point, for for almost like. 16 years or something or maybe seven, yeah something like that uh, i'd been i'd been trying to get this job right and then i finally had it and i was like okay what now <laughs> but thankfully work has been busy enough to, to keep me away from asking that question too much yeah so the seabound um kind of wave had a, uh i had a um, it had a the advantage of being front-ended very heavily so we had done concepts models for that for a very long time before i even joined the ninjago team i used to be in concept design so i did a lot of concepts for them um so i think we built the first concepts for seabound four years ago um which there was three different underwater directions that we were or, or on the water slash underwater directions as we knew that we we're going to do a nia season right um and one of the directions was kind of what became seabound in the end with like the kind of focused around the royal family um, living on the bottom of the sea and the ninjas kind of traveling to go, go there, right? Kind of an Atlantis vibe. Um, so there was a, there was a ton of, ton of both sketches. I think you might have some of the sketches from the, um, from the package that you were sent for the anniversary. Was Seabound in there? I don't remember. Fair enough. Uh, so we had basically a, a like a lot of concept art, but also a lot of models because for a lot of the te tests, we ended up testing with a big board and then a couple of large models that could, could kind of give an impression. Um, so we had a lot of different versions of the Hydro Bounty, actually. There was one that looked a lot more like a modern submarine, mostly gray. Uh, and then we had a lot that looked a lot uh, more like a like a boat than an actual submarine. And then we ended up going for much more of a bounty direction in the end. Um so for that specific model, it was actually the the final aesthetic direction was set by by a piece of concept art, and then there was a sketch model made by another designer that was um, much uh, wider um, and much shorter. And then as we knew that we wanted to kind of 
go for a more elegant design. I was it was given to me, and I, I kind of stretched it um, and turned up, changed the color scheme slightly. Um, I made it a lot more aggressive because the previous version was a little bit more uh, elegant, and we wanted something that was both elegant but also aggressive. Um, and then I started kind of iterating on it. I have a couple of pictures on my Twitter that show the process. Um, but basically, the concept that it was an underwater bounty esque vehicle. Um, the reason why it doesn't have a dragon head in the front is because we initially didn't want it to be a bounty. We wanted it to be something that was launched out of the bounty. Um, and then we kind of go, went back on it and made it basically like a weird cousin of the bounty. Um, and I thought it would be cool if instead of a dragon head, we would have a kind of like a robot head um, on the front of the, the ship. So that was uh, something I did very early on. And then I was kind of playing around with um, the features, like the fins that opened up. And we used to have kind of more fin like this that opened up like that. Um, but as uh, as we were looking at what to do for like a like more original direction and with the kind of limited space we had in the back, because we knew that there was going to be two small submarines in the front, um, I tried to figure out a function that was both like fun but also elegant to build and not didn't take up too much of the parts and too much of the uh, kind of volume of the interior of the set. So that's how we came came with the the opening function. Um, it's interesting because this model I started working on right before the pandemic happened. And then I kind of halfway through had to start building in my apartment instead, which is very strange. But um, so at that point in time, I had just figured out the fu function as we started working from home. So that was good because figuring out a function while working from home is very, very hard because a lot of testing goes into it and you need to have the appropriate pieces, right? I had a, I have a pretty decent Lego collection at home, but, it's my, nicer to work uh, work from the office. So I think a lot of the inspiration from that model came from like uh, kind of, I don't want to say steampunk because it's very overused, but like the, the very ornate League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, G G Gentlemen uh, kind of submarine. That one was on, on my inspiration board. And then uh, a lot of my own inspirations, a lot of anime references. Um, <laughs> and... Yeah, I think what helped was that the brief was like super clear. It was always like, you need to have a submarine that looks like a bounty and fits two submarines inside of it. Um, and that was kind of pretty straightforward. I think the most, the hardest parts to figure out were the structure because it needed to be that long and that like hollow on the inside to fit both of them in there. Um, that it made a lot of sense to try and figure out a way to build it with like big hull pieces that go on the bottom for the normal use for an airplane. Uh, and once that was done, I was kind of trying to figure out how to properly um, um, support that from both sides. And that's where the space shuttle door in transparent blue actually came in very useful because the um, all the doors that I built ended up kind of smashing if you push them slightly too hard because there's so little space to work with um, that the new space shuttle door actually worked perfectly because it, it's all just one piece and it fits over it perfectly and it matched the aesthetic that we were going for. So uh, that was a perfect fit in that regard. And then it's, yeah, the, the mech on the front is just, I love mechs. So, and there was a lot of space in the front that we couldn't use to store submarines. And I couldn't figure out an interior that was nice enough to actually have there. So it made a lot of sense to have another play feature where the mech comes out of the front. And that was something that was added after we kind of locked in the concept for the TV show, which is why it's not represented in the TV show in that regard. No, I mean, there's a, there's a, there was one with dark red uh, and dark blue. So dark blue was actually the original concept. Uh, and then I switched to um, flame yellowish orange, the 191. It's like a kind of, not the regular yellow that we have, but it has a little bit of orange to it. Because that's the color that we end up using for a lot of the interior for these sets. So I thought it'd be cool as the ninja vehicle, as the like team vehicle to have that color carry through. But it didn't contrast enough with the white. So we switched to dark red, and then everybody's like, no, just go for black. Um, that's how we ended up in black. So a little bit of red here and there within the decorations, and the, the, the there's like a decorated tile on the side that has some red, which is nice. And there's some blue represented within the, the sail in the back, which is nice too. Um, I think without those, it did look a little bit bland. They were definitely quite hard to develop, also because we were working from home. Um, the... Um, I'm very personally very happy about the the, the hydro mech as well because um, it was originally going to be about a forty dollar mech, and then we were asked to push the price point down as uh, a lot of the uh, C bound sets are quite high up there. Like we have uh, an eighty 
a uh, 80, 100, and 140, I think, 130, depending on your region, um, as our three highest price points. So it made sense to make the lower price point even lower. So they pushed it for 20, but they won't, like, we wanted to try and keep as much of the size impression of a 40. It was also originally a Kai mech, uh, which is very funny because it didn't actually end up going underwater in the TV show. Um, but it was, um, it looked a lot more like a crab, like it had a very hunched posture and had a very big carapace on top. And then one one really big claw and one small claw. <laughs> um, and that was then kind of put through uh, uh, a Lloyd, <laughs> a Lloyd uh, direction and uh, downsize. Um, and with that downsize, I also thought it would make a lot of more sense to push the age mark of the set down, which I know to fans is not that important an age mark, but within Lego, age marks are very important. Um, so a seven plus, you, there's a lot you cannot do at that age. Um, so if you go through that build, it's actually extremely um, straightforward in a in a way that uses a lot of pieces that seven year olds can understand and can build their own things with, and it's like just basically the whole torso is built up that way. Uh, and then you snap the individual pieces on, which is something that we do a lot for lower age marks because it, it basically makes it easier for the kids to focus on it. Um, as well as the element selection, of course, has to be um, much more obvious. You cannot have too many pieces that are the same color um, and the same shape because kids might get confused. So the, both the challenge of $20 mech of that size and 7 Plus was really fun for me to tackle because I personally, as a, as a person, I was, as a kid, so... Uh, obsessed with Lego and with the concept of building my own stuff. For me personally, it's very important that the sets that I make are actually really, really fun to build and make sure that they, the pieces that I give kids are actually interesting pieces to build with. Right. Mm -hmm. And on the other end of the spectrum that we have the bounty, which is a lot more crazy and has some, yeah. some more silly building techniques in it. This means there's something for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. I think I think it keeps. I think that's one of the things that makes me very excited about my job right now is that. Um, so I've done stuff for Boost, like Lego Boost, which is super technical. And I've done much more concept stuff, which is just very free. And then I've done Hidden Side, which is a whole different story altogether. But yeah. then what is great about Ninjago is that we have such a wide age age range and such a wide audience that we can do very complex models like the Bounty and the uh, the hydro mech at the same time, which means that I can switch between different things if I want to, and that way I can keep my like stay like I guess active in my mind instead of kind of getting stuck in a rut, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. Speaking of sets, I know you've designed a few. What was your favorite set to work on? That's a tough one. I mean, my favorite set to work on is not out yet. Mm -hmm. It will come out next year. Uh, it a secret. <laughs> I think my favorite my my favorite wave to work on was actually next year. Uh, I think uh, I think we made some 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 really really fun toys. Um, this lets us know there's good stuff coming. Yes, um, and then the one that has come out, I think it's got to be the Zane Titan mech because mm -hmm. I love mechs, like they're they're so much fun to design. And I think that one um, that one came together so smoothly, and the process for it was really really fun. Um, I really like the build, especially the uh, the torso build. It's very like efficient in its parts usage. It's not like super overcomplicated. And then you kind of ramp up the difficulty with le with the legs, and then have a cool down with the arms, which are relatively straightforward to build. I think that's my favorite set. Um, it's actually one of my first ones officially on the team too. That was a, because the Thunder Raider I did while being a uh, hidden side designer. They just needed somebody to do. Uh, an MDP. So I did that kind of off the books. I mean, during work hours, but uh, not as part of the Ninjago team. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But those came much later because they didn't have as much of a lead time. Even though they're the same launch, there was... Because they're easier to produce, we didn't need that much of a like a run up to it to make sure that we figure out uh, how to actually put it in the box. There's actually a lot of time from the moment that I hand something off to the moment that it can that it's in stores, right? Because there's so much logistics logistics to figure out.
personally, a lot of my inspiration comes from animation and to a lesser extent movies. I watch a lot of a lot of mecha and like super robot anime. So uh, I like also going back and I'm, I'm myself, I'm kind of a fan of the uh, 80s kind of designs for super robots where it's all very bombastic and very over the top and doesn't really have to make too much sense as long as it looks really cool, right? Yeah, Transformers, and uh, I really like Gao Gaigar, actually. He's one of my favorite kind of combining robots because it's just so over the top. Like the shot, like there's a... It, Gao Gaigar is a robot that combines a bunch of different bunch of different vehicles, and his arms are uh, a high-speed train. And they combine by having his chest open up from the side, and high-speed train flies through and forms the arms. I think it's oh, that's cool. so stupid, but so cool, right? Like it's... <laughs> It's such a it's such a zany concept that you've never seen it anywhere before, right? Yeah, I love that kind of stuff. Um, and then I buy and look at a lot of toys. Um, I, I watch I watch a lot of toy reviews, and I end up buying quite a few myself. Um, where it's just playing around with different toys and seeing what seeing what kind of crazy ideas that people come up with. Mm-hmm. All right. Our next question is. When it came to designing the legacy sets, how much liberty was given while still maintaining the likeness of the original set? It really depends per set. Um, kind of with legacy, we have two different directions that we like to go. Either we take something and we blow it up and we make it kind of like a, a remastered version where we make, make it even cooler. Uh, and that's especially the case if it was already, if the TV show had already stuck to the original model as it was. Um, so if, for instance, the, the Titan mech in the TV show looks pretty much exactly like the toy. I think the main difference is it has some thrusters in his back that aren't represented on the toy. Uh, but I think everything else is there. And then the um, the Thunder Raider um, is basically the same thing, right? Where the, the TV show made it look pretty much exactly like the toy. So in both those cases, I was told, make a cool version of this, like your interpretation. Uh, and for the Titan mech, they actually pushed me to go further. So with the with the with the Thunder Raider, what I was what I was told was basically make a make a bigger version of this. I um, you know kids like this set. If you want to make a, a a new version of it that's bigger and kind of more exaggerated, then go for it. Um, so I started I basically started with uh, with the original model and kind of look at what are the most iconic things about it. What is the what is the thing you think about when you think about the Thunder Raider and kind of blow those things up, which is why the the mech has even kind of stomp your boots and and even wider shoulders and why the the the, the strange wing construction on top of the on top of the lightning tank is that what's called i forgot the official name for it um jay's vehicle on that set uh i i really tried to accentuate that kind of star shape that was on top um so that was the case in that one and then with the zane mech they basically told me i made a, one version that was basically the exact same thing that i did for the thunder raider but for this one where i take the original i kind of exaggerate the proportions and they told me this is neat but we want to do something totally crazy something completely fresh with like a titan mech zane titan mech and a flavor to it so i i went a completely different direction and they said okay find somewhere the middle road there and figure out what what is the appropriate amount of freshness to add to this concept specifically because with that said we also wanted to we wanted to reach out reach uh uh, said the older audience as well, and people that are into specifically mechs, um, which is why we could get away with uh, having knees, for instance. I mean, the knees are uh, a quite experimental design, uh, and that's that was really fun to get to try and implement to set. And that's specifically because of the age mark and a kind of target demographic that we have for that set. The thing about knees is that a knee is only as good as the ankle, right? Because you kind of need the ankle also for articulation. And that is definitely the, my biggest struggle in making bigger mechs, because for the bigger mechs, we don't really have a good ankle joint, um, because the ball joint is not is not actually set up to be carrying that big of a model, right? So for instance, on the, on the Fire Stone mech, that ball joint is mostly there to allow you to tilt the feet, but not actually carry any of the weight of the model, right? Like it doesn't stop it from falling over forwards or backwards. Um, which is why we have to build in a lot of the stops, which is also the case for the Zane Titan mech, right? Like the that mech has um, has um, quite a, a quite an aggressive stop both in the front and the back of its feet, um, just to make sure that 
it won't fall over if you just put it straight on the table. So that's something that as a, as a designer that we constantly kind of have to literally kind of give or take a few millimeters. Like you do you add a little bit to the stop. Do you add, take a little bit away? Because if you add too much to the stop, it means that your knees are pointless, right? Um, but if you don't have too, enough to stop, then it won't pass through our quality restrictions. Um, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, the easy answer is everything, right? Uh, the, the concept that we need to balance so many things as a design at the same time, um, like buildability and making sure it's, it's on budget, making sure we don't change too many colors of pieces because that will limit, like we're limited in the amount of pieces that we can color change per year as a project. Right. So, um, And then also making sure that it's optimized for both building and for production. So it's basically, it's an extremely large equation that you're constantly changing tiny factors of and changing a tiny factor here might just completely ruin everything down the line uh, for other processes. So it's trying to anticipate those things and try to balance those. Um, but as far as like individual task goes, that's, that's hard. It must be uh, me as a mech designer, the stability test, making sure that kids can play with it um, because it doesn't matter how cool your mech is. If it can't stand up, then we have a problem. Right. Um, so kind of having that, that, that kind of battle over millimeters of, of trying to figure out what if I change this into this brick and it will make the angle of the, of the shin going into the ankle slightly less steep and it will make him not tip over. If you play with it like this, uh, that kind of stuff, it's like very nitty gritty stuff that you do kind of towards the end of the model development. That's, that's really hard to kind of figure out, especially because then you're kind of already set in your design. You kind of know what it's supposed to look like. So changing anything at that point is going to be, um, of course, not ideal because you've already had the time to think about everything, right? So if something looks a specific way, you already have a pretty good idea of what it's supposed to look like. But then if you have to change, I made a mech recently and I had to basically make the feet about an inch longer because otherwise you would stand up. Uh, that was really a hard process because you had to try and figure out if you change that many factors, because it's quite a lot, right? Um, if you change that many factors, everything else changes as well, right? You know, like your your budget changes, uh, the way in which you split it into different bags changes, the way it looks changes, which is personally the hardest part, of course. Um, so yeah, I think it's the I think it's mostly stability for me personally, but in the grand scheme of things, it's how everything is interconnected, right? Like making one change results in a kind of like a, a cascading effect of changes. Yeah, so when we make a model, we try to make sure that when you dump the parts of a bag out, that they that there's no pieces that look too much the same, uh, that there's not too many pieces in that bag, and that it represents a, a healthy amount of bricks to have on the table at once, and you won't completely burn out from looking for it. So recently, we had a final build-through on a model, and we ended up splitting one of the bags in two because there ended up being too many pieces, specifically in black in that bag, because we had um, we had one bag that was a lot of black pieces, but I'd optimize in a way that it was mostly the same pieces, which helps. Uh, but then it was so many that we ended up still cutting it in half, um, which then changes everything down the line as well. Yeah. Now, is there anything you weren't prepared for or expecting when you're first starting? Yeah, I guess, I guess I wasn't really expected. Like the amount of work that goes on behind the scenes that, happens after you or while you're designing a model right like the amount of check-ins that i have to do with people to make sure everything is correct right like they come over to me and it's like hey this is packaging design you have to look at this hey this is uh this is how we ended up managing to fit it within these bags that you've given us this is how uh we we uh like test it for stability right like there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that's not directly involved in designing a model uh that is absolutely crazy um it's also very interesting to see the process of making a physical product while also making a TV show, um, because they're kind of you're kind of both running at the same time, right? And you're trying not to run too far away from each other. Um, that process is very interesting to see. Thankfully, I'm not the liaison on our team for uh, for that, but it's interesting to be part of that process, not nonetheless, um, because again, you're working together with a team that's it's halfway across the world, and they are making. The scripts, well, I mean, the scripts are half made, uh, well, partially made in-house, in of course, with uh, Tommy here. Um, but the scripts, the stories, the, the the 3D models, the textures, everything is made by a completely separate team, right? 
Uh, and I think that's easy to forget when you look at something that is as, I think I could say that we're pretty cohesive in Ninjago, that there's so many different facets to it, right? Um, for last year, I worked on a lot of the um, kind of promotional items for Ninjago. And that was crazy because each of those promotional items is attached to another client and another different organization. Um, so yeah, Ninjago has like huge, like even though the Ninjago concept is pretty straightforward or the kind of the, the things that go into it, it's roots go everywhere throughout the company and, and outside of it too. Um, so that's pretty crazy. That's awesome. Well, we often have at least five or six copies of a model we're working on it, um, just to make sure that we can test them. And if something, if somebody need, like, uh, for instance, if marketing needs to have a, a, a model for a uh, workshop they have on trying to kind of figure out how the packaging will look, they will need a model, right? So we often have quite a few copies of a model floating around, especially after after we've locked the concept. Um, you kind of start iterating, and then you can give the older versions away. Uh, often, what we do, the ironic part is that for the testing, especially the quality testing, we would have to make one that's 100% up to date, right? Which is quite a lot of work because it's a lot of different pieces go into it, uh, and then hand it off to them to just destroy it, right? Like it will come back completely destroyed because that's just how it works. Um, so that's uh... yes, yep. <laughs> I think it's really interesting to see how many different styles we've done now, especially the uh, people were very nervous about the uh, uh, Master of the Mountain packaging design, how kind of um, rendered it was uh, with all the mood lighting and stuff, but I, I like thought those. it looked amazing. There's actually a lot of different versions that we made for it that were that the marketing people made for it that um, ended up so much more rendered. They looked like... like uh, like video games, basically, where they were just everything was like super textured, even though it was flat Lego bricks, right? So they pushed back a little bit against that, and then we kind of found a happy medium, which I think looks incredible. Certainly, yeah. Uh, I like the serpent design that carries over from the island too. Uh, I think it looks really, really cool. So, what was your one and only thing that you go to to get your motivation going? <laughs> um, it's it's. It's got to be one of two things. Can I give two answers? Because it's you said specific, very specifically one, but I think it would be underselling it. Yeah, what do you do to stimulate that art block? That's it. Um, for me, it's very much sitting down with uh, my my good friend Nico, who works kind of all across the company right now. He used to work for Ninjago. He, he made the, the first Ninjago city set. And often I show him something that he built, and he's both very critical, but also very um, playful, I guess. He... He will, it's very easy for, for me and him to just sit down and start just brainstorming and making something, making up something crazy, right? Um, the other day I showed him a model and he was like, what if it what if it did something really dumb? I can't tell you what it is because maybe we'll actually put it in the set. And I was like, hey, that's really cool. And then within, within 30 minutes I had something scraped together, right, to kind of show what that crazy thing would be. Um, so I think I think that kind of, those kind of interactions uh, helped me a lot with... Uh, yeah, keeping going. That's awesome. And the other one's music, soundtracks. I listen to a lot of very, like, pumped soundtracks. T soundtracks while I'm working. Yeah, um, the nice. the the musical journey one is actually really really good for building. Uh, if I need to try and speed it up, I try and pick something a little bit, it's a little bit higher pace, but. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's always really fun to get to share these stories, especially because from my perspective, um, I remember the moments that I was most fired up to 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 get this job, right? Like the moments where I where I really really crystallized for me that what this job would represent and what I, the how much I wanted to do it was moments where I got to interact with designers, which was always magical. Like it was it was always in very different ways from social media today. It was often often in like events, like Lego World used to be a thing where I used to go to. Um, as a kid and talk to designers and some of the designers that I used to talk to are now my colleagues. And that's just, 
that's really fun. 